have your Bible, please turn with me to the book of 2 Peter. The book of 2 Peter. We are continuing our sequential exposition through 2 Peter. And I confess this morning that I have seven points. I don't think I will be able to get through all seven points. However, I would like us to finish the book of 2 Peter today. So I'm just going to start and we'll see where we end up, but hopefully we'll finish the book. And then that means, God willing, next week we were going to, or are going to start, God willing, the book of Galatians. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at faith and what faith means and all the good stuff about faith that relates to the gospel and sanctification. We're excited to jump into that book. Would you please join me as I read? Our text for this morning is 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless, And blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Father, as we now come to receive the food of your holy word, we ask that, Spirit of God, you would illuminate us. Illuminate our minds so that we might understand your word. And give us passion for the reality of the day of the Lord. And may it so transform our lives the way that Peter says it should here. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. C.S. Lewis once wrote, The second coming of Christ is the medicine our condition especially needs. That's a fantastic quote. Because C.S. Lewis is accurately stating that the reality of the second coming should impact the way you live your life today. If you came into this room living in sexual immorality, after hearing this text, you should leave forsaking sexual immorality. If you came into this room struggling with drunkenness, you should leave this room forsaking drunkenness. If you came into this room coveting someone's wife or someone's bank account, you should leave this room forsaking that. The second coming of Christ is the medicine that our condition needs. This morning, we're going to notice how the day of the Lord, believed and rightly understood, changes the way believers live their lives. Before we jump into our seven points this morning, I would like to 
make some preliminary remarks regarding the day of the Lord. Now we've noted through 2 Peter chapter 3 and earlier in chapter 1 that Peter often deals with this thing called the day of the Lord. Notice verse 10 of our text, 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come. The day of the Lord is a phrase that is used in the Bible to refer to end times events that involve God's wrath. Now, for those of you that have been joining us for our midweek Bible study um, on dispensational premillennialism, I'm going to show you a graph that we've already shown you. I showed this last week. By the way, we got all those messages up. If you missed uh, Dr. Fazio's presentation on Daniel's 70th week last Wednesday, go check it out. If you missed Dr. Marsh's presentation on the rapture and the day of the Lord, go check it out. But I want to show you a graph just to answer the question or tell you rather when I believe the day of the Lord occurs. This again comes from Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. And here he drew a picture that adequately shows dispensational premillennialism, which is what we hold to at our church. This is an eschatological view of the millennial reign of Christ. Now the day of the Lord is a day um, that involves God's wrath that is poured out on the world. When does that occur? Well, it occurs at the return of Christ, which happens right here. See the down arrows? That's the return of Christ from a dispensational premillennialist view that then ushers in the millennial reign. I also believe that the day of the Lord occurs um, at the resurrection of unbelievers and judgment at the end of the millennial reign in the beginning of the eternal state. We're gonna talk more about this on Wednesday night. So if that confuses you, come out on Wednesday night and we'll unpack it a little bit more. But I show that just to say that some dispensational premillennialists believe that the day of the Lord occurs during the tribulation period. Um, mean, which actually begins, I'm sorry, I said it begins with his second coming, but it begins at the ra- after the rapture. The church is raptured and he begins to pour out wrath on earth. That's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, I believe, encompasses two periods. Uh, the beginning of the tribulation and the end of the millennial reign. And I gave arguments for why I believe that, but I just wanted to show this Uh, to you by way of reminder. Now I'd like to just draw you, uh, your attention rather, to verse 10 as we're getting our running start into the text this morning. Some preliminary remarks. First, we noted that the day of the Lord involves two future periods. Second, I also want you to note that the day of the Lord will come. Notice verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come. This is a day that is going to happen. Peter has been combating the false teachers who deny that the day of the Lord uh, is real so that they can continue in their sinful lifestyles. Third, the day of the Lord will be unexpected. Notice verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come and it will come like a thief. Coming like a thief has the idea of the day being unexpected or it'll be a surprise. Pastor Ryan, you just showed us a graph about when the day of the Lord will take place. I did. That's uh, looking at when it will come as it relates to God's timetable for end times events, but we do not know the day or the hour. The day will come like a thief. It will come unexpectedly. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, for the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. The day of the Lord is going to take the world by surprise. Not because we are silent about it. We are not. Believers are calling people to turn from their sin and place their faith in Christ because Jesus came the first time to seek and to save the lost. He did not come to judge, but to give his life as a ransom for many during his first visitation. But he is coming again and he is coming not to save, but to judge and to destroy and to exercise his holy wrath against all his enemies. But the world mocks us. The world would like to think that evolution is real. And so the world just continues to get better 
It evolves to become better than it was in past ages. But the Bible says that God is going to intervene in history and it's going to be like someone who takes a brick and throws it through a window. It's going to come crashing down. And it's going to come suddenly when people least expect it. But believers should not be surprised by his coming. Because, as we're reminded again today, we should be focused on the reality of his coming day. And that impacts the way we live. The day of the Lord will be unexpected. Fourthly, the day of the Lord will include an end of the heavens. Notice verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. Now the heavens is a description of what we might call today the universe. It's not heavens as it relates to the place where God dwells. But we would say when we look to the sky, we look to the heavens. 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people really didn't have a word for universe like we have a word today. So here, the idea of the word heavens is referring to the universe. The universe will pass away with a roar. This word roar is an interesting word. It means a rushing sound or a whizzing of an arrow. Sometimes it was used to refer to a rushing of wings or a hissing of snakes. It's kind of a word that's used to describe the sound of air moving, like whish. Like the sound of a basketball swishing into a net. It's an interesting word. Now, because of the context in which it's used here, and its context is God destroying the world with fire, one commentator wrote that it probably refers to a crackling of the sound of fire. Notice the text again in verse 10. The heavens, the universe, it's going to all be destroyed in a roar. Whoosh. That's it. Gone. Everything. Pluto, Saturn, Jupiter. Notice, not only does the day of the Lord include the end of the heavens, but the day of the Lord also includes the destruction of the elements. Now there's some debate here about what elements refers to. But I think it's best to take elements as referring, as one um, Greek scholar says, to the the basic components of the world. Atoms. Notice the text, verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. God flooded the world, but he's going to burn it the second time. This word intense heat or this phrase intense heat combined with elements seems to describe some type of atomic explosion. That's what happens in a nuclear bomb is atoms are smashed together on an atomic level that creates intense heat which produces what we know as nuclear weapons. The idea of the elements being destroyed with intense heat conveys kind of, as best we could tell, maybe this idea of an explosion. Peter wants us to make sure that we're not missing his point. So he goes on and he gives us a sixth observation regarding the day of the Lord. And he says that the day of the Lord includes that the earth and its works will be burned up. Notice verse 10. Not only will the elements be destroyed with intense heat, but the earth and its works will be burned up. Listen, everything that you own will burn. Your wedding rings, the clothes that you're wearing, the cars that you're driving, the house that you have, everything that you have ever touched materially will cease to exist. Isn't it so crazy that we hang on so tightly to that stuff? It's all gonna burn. And God is the one who will do it. So how should you live your life in light of that? And that's where Peter takes us in verse 11. I have seven points for you this morning as it relates to our topic. The title of my message again is The Transforming Power of the Day of the Lord. 
How does the day of the Lord affect the way Christians live their lives? To say it another way, how does the day of the Lord transform our here and now? Seven points for you. Number one, the day of the Lord should transform your conduct. The day of the Lord should transform your conduct. Notice verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Peter here asks a rhetorical question. (laughs) If it's all going to go like this, what kind of a person should you be? Knowing that Jesus is going to return in wrath. That's the day of the Lord. What kind of person should you be? Particularly, note the word conduct. What kind of conduct should you have? That word refers to someone's way of life. What you should be known for. Can I ask you what are you known for? If I were to ask your spouse or your best friend or your kids, hey, what's your conduct like? What's your way of life? You see, as a pastor, I don't get to live with you 24 hours a day. You're probably thankful for that, and so am I. (laughs) But in all seriousness, there is a way in which all of us conduct ourselves. A way that we live. Sometimes people say to me, how do you change your conduct? One way? Be laser beam focused on what's coming. Because if you really believe that the day of the Lord will come, it will change. It will fuel the way you live now. And how should we live? Well, Peter gives two main components of the Christian way of life in light of the day of the Lord. Notice the text. First, what type of people ought you to be in holy conduct. The Bible uses the word holiness in several ways. When referred to God, it refers to his transcendence. It also at times refers to moral purity. More often than not, the idea of holiness refers to separation, to be other than, distinct from, Christians are to live their lives in holy conduct. To say it another way, Christians are to live their lives separate from the world. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's the Greek verb for love, agapao, And the idea is it's a love of the will. It's what you give yourself to. If someone followed you around during the week, what would they determine you are giving your life to? Jesus? The church? Or something else? You see, holy conduct has this idea of separation. Listen, I think we figured it out at this point but the world doesn't like us. And you understand why, right? It's because we are preachers of judgment because you cannot be a preacher of grace and love and mercy without being a preacher of judgment. Grace and mercy and love only make sense on the backdrop of God's wrath. God's wrath is like a black backdrop And his love and mercy and grace is like a diamond that sparkles on that black backdrop. But the other reason that the world hates us is not just because we are preachers of judgment. Listen, we are people that live in a righteous way. We live differently than them and the way that we live convicts them of the way that they live. This is what the Bible means, what Christ means when he calls us the salt of of the earth. We are preservative. We act as a restraining influence in the world because we are not going along with them. But secondly, not only are we to live holy lives. Now, by the way, why do you live a holy life? Why do you want to be separate from the world? Because God is coming to what? 
burn the world and you don't want to be caught up in that. That's the idea. People that God has saved, he has so transformed us and given us a new nature. We love the things that he loves. We hate the things that he hates. And listen, make no mistake about it. The Lord will avenge himself. He will deal with all ungodliness. His holiness demands it. If God does not deal with sin, he cannot be holy. But because God is holy, he deals with sin. And he deals with sin with wrath. Now, by the way, I was thinking about doing a whole bunch of word studies on the word wrath. But it's a scary word. It's a word that describes God, an attribute of his that he possesses. And it's a scary word. It refers to fiery indignation. The most common word in the New Testament is orge, which is where we get our word orgy from. It means anger. God is angry. And this is going to be an important component to the text as it unfolds. That's why I'm getting into this. But it's important to understand that God's anger is not like your anger. Your anger is what? Influenceable. It's passionate. Something makes you mad. You're like, I am mad. That's how I am. But God's wrath is not that way. It's uninfluenced. It's steady, controlled, calculated. He does not exercise wrath like we do. The anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And that's what makes God's wrath so scary is that when he pours it out, it is calculated and he is not taking it back. It will accomplish the purpose. He will accomplish the purpose that he desires. We as believers, we live holy lives. But secondly, note that we also live godly lives. And we could just say that If you were just to sum up in two words, how does a Christian live? This is what Peter's doing. The two ways that we live are real simple. One is holiness, separation. But the second word is a little different, and it is the word godliness. One Greek scholar defines godliness. Notice again the verb, in uh, or the noun rather, in verse 11. One Greek scholar defines the noun godliness, listen to this, as a particular manner of life in which a believer is devoted to God. In his book, Respectable Sins, Jerry Bridges gives us a helpful definition of ungodliness that helps us understand godliness a little bit better. Listen to this quote. Ungodliness may be defined as living one's everyday life with little or no thought of God's will or of God's glory or of one's dependence on God. You can readily see then that someone can lead a respectable life and still be ungodly in the sense that God is essentially irrelevant to his or her life. We rub shoulders with such people every day in the course of our ordinary activities. They may be friendly, courteous, and helpful to other people, but God is not in their thoughts. They may even attend church for an hour or so each week, but then for the remainder of the week, God does not exist. They are not wicked people. They are just ungodly. James describes ungodliness in James 4, verses 13 and 15, when he says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know, James says in chapter 4, verse 14, what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do uh, this or that. You see, godliness is the idea of piety. Holiness means that we're separate, but godliness, listen to this, means that we're close. Holiness means that we're separate from the world, but godliness means that we're close to God. 
You see, because sometimes you meet some Christians and they're all fired up about what? Holiness. And you're like, bro, don't you even like love anybody? And they don't seem to manifest an affection for God. But then on the other side of the coin, you have Christians that are all about godliness, but they don't manifest any holiness. I love going to church and learning about the Bible. And I even like to go to prayer meetings. I just feel so close to God. And I love serving in the children's ministry. But man, I can't wait to get home tonight. Neither are Christian in and of themselves. They go together. You see, this is a way to describe the totality of our way of life as true believers. We are holy. But we are also pious. Gosh, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't understand Christians that say, I love Jesus, but just not the church. You love Jesus, but not his bride. That's like telling me you love me, but not my wife. That doesn't make sense. You see, piety, godliness, is this idea that we love him. You see, we could use other words, and I have them on the screen for you to see. We could use the word separation or consecration. We could also use the words repentance and faith. This is just what it means. Repentance means I turn from holiness. Faith means I turn to God. And we exercise repentance and faith in every moment. We are holy, we are godly, we are separate, we are consecrated. Pastor Ryan, I want to be more godly. Meditate on the day of the Lord. Look at the cross references in your Bible and look up all the texts you can look up about the day of the Lord. Pick up a good systematic theology book and turn to the the section on ecclesi- eschatology, the study of last things. And look up the section on the day of the Lord and read everything that you can read on the day of the Lord and do it with trembling. You'll press into the Lord if indeed the Spirit of God is within you. But if these words and this truth falls on your heart, a hard heart that's like rocky ground, and the seed of the truth of the day of the Lord does not take root, something is wrong inside. The day of the Lord impacts us, and particularly in our conduct. I know what you're thinking. How are you going to get through seven points this morning? I do not know. Point number two, the day of the Lord transforms our evangelism. Notice verse 12. But looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Notice the word hastening. Do you see that day or that word? It is defined by one leading lexicon as to cause something to happen or to come into being by exerting a special effort. This in no way contradicts the sovereignty of God. Although Peter here is telling us that we can, listen to this, hasten the day of the Lord. In just a moment, he's going to show us why we would want to hasten the day of the Lord. Remember, 1 Thessalonians tells us that we as believers are not destined for wrath. There's something else we're looking forward to at the day of the Lord. It's not his wrath. But we are looking forward to something, as we'll note in just a moment. This in no way contradicts God's sovereignty. God ordains the end of all things, but listen, he also ordains the means by which he accomplishes his purpose. God has chosen to accomplish bringing about the day of the Lord through us in part. How do you and I hasten the day of the Lord? Well, in two ways. First, by praying. By praying. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. If this is not a part of your prayer life, it needs to become. Here on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, our Lord's great sermon. Now this is Jesus, and the sermon, the audience, is Jewish people. 
Remember, the church has not come into existence yet. He covers a myriad of subjects, but he also includes a section on how to pray. Now, this is a section that talks about how we ought to live our lives, and because we are in Christ, this should certainly apply to the church as well, not just Israel. But notice he says in verse 9, then pray this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name means uh, may your name be glorified. May you be glorified in all of the earth. Starting your prayer with our Father who is in heaven reminds you first who you're talking to. You're not in heaven. By saying our Father who is in heaven, you're reminded he is your Father, but he is just not your earthly Father. He is your heavenly Father. But we also then are to prioritize our prayer life, listen to this, about being about his glory. We, we tend to, our prayer lives tend to be about our needs. Jesus' way of praying is prayer begins and focuses on the glory of God. It's not man-centered, it's God-centered. Pray then this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, and then notice, your kingdom, what? All right, Bible students, here we go. For those of you that hold to a literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic and have been coming for the last three weeks during the summer series, the kingdom of God refers to what? I see some people whispering it. You can say it. It's all right. Come on. The millennial reign. It's not now. This is one of the things that's massively understood. Dr. Marsh covered this briefly in his lecture. When he instructs us to, or them to pray, your kingdom come, what is he talking about? The millennial reign, when Jesus physically rules and reigns on David's throne for a thousand years. How do we hasten the day of the Lord? We ask for it. Bring it. Why would we ask for God to rain down judgment? Have you ever read the Psalms? There's a whole section in there we call the imprecatory Psalms. And the psalmists are writing, asking God to bring down judgment. It's a whole section of psalms. Why? Because he has changed us, conformed us to the image of his son, and we now, as he does, longs for what? Holiness. Now, I want you to hold all this in your mind because we're going to get somewhere that's pretty amazing in this text. How do we hasten the coming day of the Lord? Number one, we pray for it. But number two, turn to Acts chapter three. We evangelize. We evangelize. And this seems to be implied in Acts chapter three, verse 19, as Peter gives his second sermon. Notice verse 19 of Acts chapter three. Therefore, repent, this is Peter preaching, Peter evangelizing. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away, listen to this, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Interpreted literally, times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord seems to be a reference to the millennial kingdom. And that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, which God spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets from ancient time. Repent and return to the Lord. He's talking to Jewish people. Repent, return to the Lord, so that times of refreshing may come. Well, what is times of refreshing may come? Well, notice that Jesus may come, that he may send, that is God the Father, send Jesus Christ. But then verse 21, but heaven had to first receive him until the restoration of all things. Hasten the day of the Lord. We ask for the day of the Lord to come. And as we evangelize, and we noted this last week, that God is patient toward the church, waiting for all those that he has chosen to come in. As we evangelize, God has a fixed number of elect of the church, of his bride that he has called. He has called them from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He has called them through the centuries. There is some point in the future that God only knows where all that he has chosen in the church to be saved will come in. God will save people after the church during the tribulation, right? We've noted that. If that's totally confusing to you, come on Wednesday nights. How do we hasten the day of the Lord? Through prayer and through evangelizing. 
Point number three. Turn back to the text, Second Peter. We're going to go quickly now. I'm going to stop at four points. But I'll give you the last three to write down, all right? Sometimes people say, you said there were seven and you only gave us four. I need the three. Mm-hmm. Point number three. How should the day of the Lord impact the way we live today? It should transform your motivations. It should transform your motivations. Notice the word looking, looking in verse 12 and verse 13, and then the word look in verse 14. The word looking is defined as giving thought to something that is hoped for in the future. Looking and hastening the coming of the day of God. But according to his promise, we are looking, verse 13. Verse 14, therefore, since you look for these things, what are we looking for? Pastor Ryan, you just said that the day of the Lord is a day where God pours out judgment on the world. Why in the world should I look forward to that? Well, there's three reasons given. Three reasons why we should look forward to the day of the Lord. First, look at verse 12, quickly now. Looking and hastening, and then notice the coming of the day of God. You see the word coming? It's the Greek word parousia. It's used all throughout the New Testament to refer to the second coming of Christ. As we've noted before, the day of the Lord is a day when Christ himself returns. We want Christ to return. We want him to come again. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. But secondly, we want him to come because Remember, again, according to how you interpret when the day of the Lord takes place, I believe that the day of the Lord involves two periods, beginning at the tribulation and again at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. That perspective then means that it ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. Look at verse 13. But according to his promise, we are looking for what? New heavens and a singular new earth in which righteousness dwells. The new heavens and the new earth. After the millennial reign of Christ, the great white throne of judgment occurs. Satan is thrown into the abyss. And all those who have rebelled against Christ go into eternal hell. And that ushers in what we call in theology the eternal state or the new heavens and the new earth. God makes a new heaven, melts the heavens, or the heavens disappear in a roar. And then he destroys the earth with intense heat And then he makes a new heavens and a new earth. If you want to read about that, you can go to Revelation 21 through Revelation 22, verse 5. That whole chapter is about the new heavens and the new earth. John MacArthur in his book, Biblical Doctrine, notes 10 distinctives about the new heavens and the new earth. He says there will be a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem, a new people of God, a new compassion, a new order, a new temple, a new light, a new population, a new life, and a new glory. But I'd just like to draw your attention to a new compassion. Turn to Revelation 21. Why in the world should we look forward to the day of the Lord? What are you looking forward to in your life? Retirement? Vacation? Having more kids? Making more money? The moms that have got their kids out of their house are like, "Uh uh-uh. Now listen, none of those things are necessarily bad to look forward to, but for the believer, they should not be our ultimate drive. What we should ultimately be looking for is the new heavens and the new earth. Notice verse four of Revelation 21. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. And there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. That day is the day that I want. That is the day. So we say, Lord, we're looking for that day. We want it to come. We want to hasten its coming. Transforms our motivation because, or we want it rather to come because Christ is coming. Secondly, the new heavens and the new earth. And then notice he makes a further, go back to Second Peter if you're not there. He makes a further 
observation about the new heavens and the new earth. And he says in verse 13, the new heavens and new earth, and then here it is in Peter's mind, in which what? Righteousness what? Dwells. You know why I want Jesus to come? Because I am so sick and tired of the sin of this world. Aren't you, brother? Aren't you, sister? How can we read the news and see what goes on and say, this is the best place ever? It's not. God will make a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We'll close with point number four. How should the day of the Lord transform your life? Actually, we're going to close with point number five. Are you all right if I keep going? Sometimes I get in trouble, all right. Transforms your relationship with other believers. Notice the text again, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in what? Found by him. When Christ calls us up in the rapture, right before the day of the Lord unfolds, how do we want to be found? We want to be found in peace. Now, What does peace mean? There are several perspectives on what this could mean. As the NIV translates it, it could refer to peace with God. Be found in peace with God. It could refer to, as some commentators think, internal peace. Be found to be settled internally. Not anxious about the coming of the Lord when he comes. I think the best interpretation is not peace with God, not internal peace, but peace with people. And I think that's what the translators of the NAS had in mind. Notice the text. Be diligent to be found by him in what? Peace. And I think he describes what peace means. It means to be spotless and blameless. That's metaphorical language. Those words taken together refer to moral purity, spotless and blameless. This is direct opposition to how the false teachers behave. Notice back in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, look at verse 13. Peter describes the false teachers that are denying the day of the Lord and says, They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes. That's a metaphorical language to speak of their immoral lifestyles. But their immoral lifestyles were disturbing their relationships with the church. There wasn't peace in the church because these false teachers were promoting unholy living. I think the idea here is that the day of the Lord should motivate us to live lives that are spotless and blameless and living spotless and blameless lives means that we are at peace with one another. Let me say it another way. If you're a parent and you're getting drunk every night, are you living at peace with your children? No, you're not because you're disturbing your children at night through your drinking. If you are someone who professes Christ and you're coveting women in the church rather than treating the older women as mothers in the faith and younger women or women your age as sisters in the faith, are you creating peace in the church? No, you're not. You're creating peace. Tension in the church. By the way, that's in Ephesians 5. It is unloving to be sexual immoral. When we sin, listen to this, we never sin in a vacuum. Meaning, our sin doesn't only affect us. It affects everyone around us. If I'm poor with my money, if I'm unwise with my money and have enormous amounts of debt and can't contribute to the needs of the saints at the church, is my sin affecting the church? Yes. Do you understand that every time we sin, it creates a lack of peace? As we're laser beam focused on the day of the Lord, we're living in holy conduct and godliness, we're spotless and blameless. When he 
comes, we will be found, what? In peace. That's in part the job of the shepherds of the church, to keep the peace. Because sheep bite each other, and they kick each other, and they yell at each other, and they sin against each other. It's important for us to understand, as we took communion together this morning, that one of the reasons why we don't want to continue to live in our sin is because we love the person to our right and our left. And our sin disrupts the peace. Fifthly, I could go all morning, but I won't. I just wanted to get here because it's so important. I forgot to give you the slides. Number five, how should the coming day of the Lord affect the way we live today? It should transform your view of God's patience. Notice, Verse 15. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters speaking uh, in them of these things, in which some of these things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Notice here that Peter's saying, why has the day of the Lord not come? Now, he already addressed this earlier in the text in verse 9, but he's reiterating what he said earlier, and he's essentially saying, hey, look, if you're wondering why the day of the Lord hasn't come yet, just regard it as salvation. God is being patient, and the reason he hasn't come is because he's waiting still for other people to come. This takes us into the doctrine of election, and I think that's what Peter has in mind when he says... In verse 15, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. And then he goes on and says that some men distort the things that he says because they're difficult to understand. I think that's one of the reasons people have a hard time with the doctrine of election. It's hard to understand. It's not easy to understand. I think that's what Peter has in mind here. But he's saying that the reason why God hasn't come is because not all that God has chosen have come in. So regard God's patience as salvation. I'd like to just draw your attention and highlight the doctrine of God's patience for a moment. Notice the word patience. It's used twice in this chapter. Once in a verb form in verse 9 and another in a noun form here in verse 15. The lexical form of the word is macrothumia. Macrothumia, which is comprised of two Greek words. Listen to this. It's a very interesting word, the word that we translate into English as patience. Macros is the first word it comes from, which means long in terms of time. It's macro, would be our English translation of macros. Long in terms of time. And thumos, which means the soul or the seat of feelings and passions, including anger and temper. The idea of patience is that God has this enormous capacity to hold back his anger, thumos. When we say we need to be more patient, what we usually mean is I need to be better at holding back my what? Anger, my frustration. This word Macrothumia, it has the idea of macro anger. God, think about this with me for a minute, is holding back an enormous, incalculable wrath right now. the idea one lexicon defines this as a state of being able to bear up under provocation or to forbear with those who have made an offense let me define the patience of God in theological terms for you A.W. Pink says this divine patience is the power 
of control with which God exercises over himself, causing him to bear with the wicked and forbear so long in punishing them. Wayne Grudem said, God's patience means God's goodness in withholding of punishment toward those who sin over a period of time. Now I gotta give you a third quote by the Puritan Stephen Charnock. If you haven't read Charnock, it's not easy reading, but he has got gems of gold. Listen to this. Speaking of God's patience, he says, it is part of the divine goodness and mercy yet differs from both. Meaning God's patience is part of his goodness and his mercy, but it's different. Listen to this. It differs from mercy in the formal consideration of the object. Mercy respects the creature as miserable. Patience respects the creature as criminal. Mercy pities him in his misery and patience bears with the sin which engendered the misery and is giving birth to more sin, end quote. In other words, when God is merciful, he's merciful towards you because you're pitiful. But when God is patient towards you, he's withstraining himself even though you're criminal. You see, when we think of the day of the Lord, it expands our view of God's patience. Do you know that he is ready to exercise divine wrath? As Jonathan Edwards says, Unbelievers are like spiders who hang over the flames of hell, only waiting for the heat of the flame to singe the silk of the spider's string that they might plunge into everlasting judgment. That's my paraphrase. Do you understand that there is a dam of wrath ready to burst at any moment? And the only reason God's wrath does not flood upon us like a tsunami is because he is patient and waiting for all those who are his to come in. Aren't you glad that that dam did not burst before he saved you? before your conversion. Aren't you glad that although you long for that day, that dam has not bursted, that your children might come in? Beloved, regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The last two points transforms your ability to guard against false teachers. False teachers say there is no day of the Lord. And then verse 18, it transforms your spiritual growth. Indeed, the day of the Lord has transforming power if we would study it, believe it, and heed it. As we do, God transforms our conduct, our evangelism, our motivations, our relationships with other believers, our view of God's patience, our ability to guard against false teachers, and he transforms our spiritual growth. Don't let anyone ever tell you again that judgment does not motivate change. There is a lie in evangelicalism, and I hear it all the time. And the idea is that what really motivates change is just understanding grace. That's true. But you cannot understand grace without the holiness and wrath 
of a righteous God. When you understand his righteous anger, oh, then grace shines as bright as the noonday sun. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your patience. Oh, how your patience is different than ours. Lord, we confess that we are creatures that are so prone to emotionalism and and reacting and being controlled by our emotions, but we praise you that you are not controlled by your feelings. No, not you, Lord. You, the transcendent one, are in control of all things. You perfectly hold all of your attributes in harmony. Your attributes are you, Lord. And we thank you that you are settled in your wrath. Lord, awaken this world. Be gracious to us. Do not give this world or our nation or our city or county over. Do not abandon us to our own sin. But awaken, Lord, our nation and our state and our county and our cities that we might seek you and rise up again, O Lord, preachers in accordance with the truth, those who will once again warn people to flee from the wrath that is to come. May we hide ourselves in you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your rescue. We love you in Jesus' name, amen.